Welcome back. It's time for a magic-filled lecture and a rather demonic one, too. So by this point, you should have read uh, Apuleius' Metamorphoses uh, at least partway through, and you also should have listened to the video here about uh, Apuleius. This is actually the concluding topic uh, for the uh, lecture series of this uh, class. It's amazing that we've come this far in Classic 396, and I'm really glad that you uh, stuck it all the way through. And uh, our final topic uh, for wrapping up uh, the um, presentation of Roman mythology is Roman magic. I'm going to keep it relatively brief here because there's actually a lot to say about magic more than, than really can be covered adequately in a video. Uh, but there are plenty of uh, uh, additional works you can consult online um, and, uh, on the subject if you if you get really fascinated with it. It's, it's really quite a diverse and, and, and fun subject to, to look into. But we'll just give you some basic uh, concepts here. So the first reason why I've brought up magic at this point is that uh, if you've read Apuleius' Metamorphoses, you're aware that Lucius was essentially a victim of magic gone wrong because as a result of the potion that he drinks that has uh, been mixed incorrectly, he ends up, instead of turning into an owl as he wanted to, uh, turning instead into a donkey. And he spends uh, almost the entire rest of that work, eight, uh, 11 books long, eight books altogether, um, uh, in, in donkey form uh, due to the uh, magical mishap that, that happens to him. The second reason I also mentioned magic also connected with Apuleius is that you may remember from the video on him that Apuleius uh, was accused of witchcraft and had to write this work called uh, um, Apology, similar to Plato's Apology about Socrates, uh, in order to get himself off. We presume that he, that he got off. So, therefore, there are some close connections between magic and the author Apuleius, and therefore it's appropriate to provide some insight into, into the topic of magic here um, as we can, as we say, uh, conclude the lecture series uh, in this course. Okay, so magic breaks down into two general categories of white magic and black magic. White magic is supposed to be beneficial to the recipient, and as you would imagine, black magic is supposed to be injurious or harmful. Now, magic, um, regardless of its type, uh, can be carried out um, in, in, by different people in various different ways. Theoretically, anybody could, in fact, learn the magic arts and become a practitioner of them uh, in the ancient Greek and Roman worlds. However, anybody involved with magic was regarded with deep suspicion by both the Greeks and the Romans. It's important to insert here that both the Greeks and the Romans did take magic seriously as something that existed, and they also suspected that many people who might want to say that they were practitioners of the magic arts were in fact charlatans and, and, and quacks and didn't know what in the world they were doing. So also anybody who really was somehow associated with magic uh, would be socially unacceptable in a way. Um, it's, what, it's for that reason, for instance, that um, Circe, uh, the uh, enchantress of whom Odysseus encounters on the way home from Troy, um, is treated as one of these rather questionable figures, um, especially the way that she turns uh, Odysseus's men all into animals, um, whom Odysseus encounters. So being a witch, Circe right there is already socially on the border, essentially. Even more so, of course, is Circe's niece, Medea, uh, the uh, granddaughter of the sun, because Medea comes from way over on, on the eastern sh uh, shore of the, the Black Sea, which is about as far away from, in, well, in this direction for you, far away from the, uh, the civilized Greek world as you can get. She, too, is a foreigner. She is a sorceress. And uh, her magic arts are going to definitely um, uh, attach suspicion to her, especially as she becomes more um, murderous and uh, criminal uh, in her activities um, as she uh, proceeds with her ultimately unsuccessful uh, marriage with Jason. So um, magic, therefore, isn't a good thing to be involved in, in either the, the Greek, with either the Greeks or the Romans. Basically, people won't like you. And, um, and therefore, um, uh, the magic, magic arts while of interest to both the Greeks and the Romans, aren't the kind of thing that one is supposed to do in, in proper society. Now, as we say, different people can carry them out. The way that magic often was carried about is ways that you would, you, you would more or less would expect. You have spells, you have uh, magical incantations, uh, there are maybe particular objects such as metal or wood that might have uh, spirits inside them that could be ca uh, called upon. Uh, so you could use a branch or you could use, uh, again, some piece of iron or something in order to be able to, to, uh, to carry out the magic arts. 
Of course, herbs were of great interest because of uh, the potions one could mix uh, using herbs, and some herbs were, were known already at that time to be medicinal, and so those could be um, uh, provided by somebody familiar with herbology and from there, uh, the magic arts as such. So, uh, th so those also could be, could be used uh, for, for magic. And then already in existence was voodoo. Uh, the the uh, uh, magic arts included uh, the art of pins uh, in order to curse somebody. And that will we'll, uh, take up when we get down here to, to black magic and, and uh, curses. But that already was, in fact, a thing. Okay, so the general division between white and black magic, as we said before, is whether it's good or bad for the recipient. So white magic, um, in mo most of its forms, had something to do with healing. If somebody uh, was in distress in some particular way, then uh, ma the magic arts could, in some cases, be used in order to heal the person. One example um, is um, if uh, somebody has been very seriously wounded, um, an astrologer type or magical type could be called in in order to um, come up with some, with some kind of additional remedy if medicine uh, wasn't going to serve the purpose. And um, one example might be um, uh, that he has to cut up a mouse and use uh, the innards of the mouse, or he's going to apply spider webs uh, on, on, on top of it in order, in order to drain up the blood or whatever that might be. So, uh, so it's those kinds of remedies that, that uh, are in the uh, realm of uh, uh, white healing magic. Magic could also be used uh, for some other kind of service for somebody, as again in the case of Lucius trying to get turned into a donkey. So white magic, therefore, um, uh, is uh, intended by the practitioners to be uh, relatively uh, benign. So um, magic, therefore, is necessarily the kind of, of show magic that I'm depicting up here with our, our wonderful uh, rabbit from the hat. But it, it could be instead um, a service carried out uh, for somebody. Not too different from, say, tarot card reading or, or fortune telling, as we, we might, might think of uh, today. All right, when we descend down here, we come into black magic, which is essentially the uh, art of the inferno. And both Circe and Medea can be regarded as practitioners of black magic in the sense that the, uh, the one who receives the black magic is injured by, by the, the recipient's sake. Now, um, Medea in particular is a devotee of the goddess Hecate, uh, whom we talked about in, in, in previous videos. Hecate uh, is an older um, Eastern goddess uh, considered to be uh, uh, to, to predate the, uh, the, the well-established Olympian gods from later. Uh, she has um, power in all uh, different um, uh, parts of the world originally. I'm going to ask you to pause your video at this point and go to your um, uh, Sakai uh, resources. There is a um, document um, by the author Hesiod, H-E-S-I-O-D. Please pause your video, go to Sakai resources, and open uh, the document called uh, Hesiod, the Theogony. Okay, do you have that? Um, you should look it over and you'll see that uh, Hesiod, uh, who is at this point in his work called Theogony, the, uh, the creation of the gods and ultimately the creation of the world, is describing the origins of specific gods. He, in this pa passage you have, uh, he spends quite a bit of time on the goddess Hecate. Uh, he commemorates her as the all-powerful goddess who is um, uh, potent in all three general realms, the earth, the sea, and the sky. The earth connection uh, also links her specifically with the underworld. It appears from the early days of, uh, of Hesiod, that is back in the 700s BC, that the connection between earth and the underworld was not necessarily regarded as malevolent. But in later days, the connection with the earth, so-called chthonic deities, uh, that's the term in Greek for, for, for any, any god uh, who is associated with the earth, becomes negative because the earth is seen as the um, progenitor of creepy poisonous things like snakes and spiders and scorpions. And also, of course, the earth houses the underworld, which is also seen, of course, as the realm of the dead. So that's in itself rather disturbing. And if you end up in the dead uh, in a bad way, you might end up getting eternally cursed or, or punished in some particular way. So uh, deities associated with earth ultimately end up becoming negative in contradistinction to the Olympian gods who are associated with Mount Olympus and therefore are associated with the celestial realm, the sky. There's a very distinct um, 
split bet uh, between those two realms, and those who are down here are put at a huge disadvantage uh, to those up here. So that includes Hecate. So she ultimately, because of her connection with Earth and the underworld, becomes associated with witchcraft. And Medea, the witch, becomes a devotee of Hecate. And in both plays we have, by Euripides and Seneca, uh, on the tragedy of Medea, her, or the slaughter of her two children uh, to punish Jason, she uh, prays to Hecate for inspiration to come up with the magic arts needed uh, to, to uh, produce the poison that will um, consume uh, Jason's new bride, the uh, princess of Corinth, and then also will give her the, the anger power needed in order to kill her own two children. So all of this is sort of on the edge, the fringe here of, of black magic. So black magic, again, uh, can, is, is, is directly associated with witchcraft and also with demons from uh, the underworld. The word demon itself, incidentally, um, is from the Greek word daimonion, which means a deity, but a deity in the sense of a subordinate deity, not one of the, the main uh, gods. Uh, Socrates used to speak about the daimonion who would guide him, essentially like, a, like an inner spirit, um, in, in, his, in his quest for truth, for justice, for human excellence, that he would try to teach uh, to the Athenians uh, in the 5th century BC. But daimonion also gets the sense of gods who are more on the fringe of society, and it's probably in, in, in that fringe uh, worship of them that the word daimonion slips into the sense of demon, of um, a deity associated with the rather um, unex uh, unappetizing uh, part of uh, mythology, specifically the uh, underworld. So black magic uh, can, uh, can do all kinds of things, like with voodoo, for instance, as we, as we said before, to do harm or injury uh, to the recipient. One especially uh, prominent way, besides voodoo, uh, in which black magic can be carried about, is with the curse tablet. Curses were used as directives, invectives against a specific victim, somebody who, who, has, who has angered the querit. And one particular way that curses can be carried out, again, one is voodoo, but the other is a particular tablet on which some particularly destructive thing is written. So, will so-and-so please get strangled? Will so-and-so please get flooded? Will so-and-so die of cold? Whatever it might be. And then the execration tablet can have something done to it. It can be burned. It can be uh, dropped into a, a, spe a special fountain um, or whatever else in order for its effect to be, to be carried out. So execration tablets are, are a negative form of this service uh, that can be used in order to uh, particularly to, uh, to, to uh, injure or punish somebody who has commit, presumably has committed some um, injustice or wrongdoing against the person who was requesting this, cur this curse to be carried out. So black magic, therefore, um, who knows uh, how uh, uh, truly effective it was. There obviously was the power of suggestion. But black magic, again, uh, did exist as a serviceable art for um, essentially carrying out some act of vengeance uh, against someone else. For your purposes in this course, it's simply uh, ad adequate to know that magic is another form of Roman myth. Uh, the idea of demons or deities who are responsible for the special magic arts. Also the idea that the gods themselves can engage in magic, as for instance when um, uh, Jupiter and Mercury turn into, into um, disguised humans with Balkis and Philemon and Ovid's Metamorphoses. Anything of that nature uh, is, is yet another form of, of Roman mythology. One last thing I will mention in connection with, with uh, black magic um, comes from Petronius' Satyricon. If you go back to uh, looking, looking over that work, you'll re recall that there is the big dinner party of Trimalchia. At, during the dinner party, there's an argument at one point that breaks out between two members of the party. When that happens, Trimalchio silences the argument by turning to one of his friends, Nicaros, for a distraction and says to Nicaros, hey, listen, um, you have been very quiet tonight, and I remember you have two, some stories that happened to you. Could you please tell one of them? So what Nicaros relates is, in fact, one of the most fascinating black magic stories that we have, and that is the story of the werewolf. We don't actually have uh, many, very many ancient depictions of werewolves. Uh, you may remember that there's a, a brief a description of them in the uh, third Harry Potter movie with uh, the figure of Lupin. But uh, the werewolf, in fact, uh, did exist as uh, one of these fringe elements of, of Roman mythology and Roman magic. Uh, the, the, uh, the term for it in Latin is worsipalus, 
which means uh, skin changer. And that essentially, the, a were were werewolf is indeed a human uh, who, at the full moon, woo, will then uh, turn immediately into a wolf. So uh, in, the, in the story as described by Nekaros, um, a, uh, two men are walking together uh, past a cemetery. One of them is a man who is trying to get home to his girlfriend, Melissa, and he's asked for his, his comrade, a, a centurion, uh, to guide him because he's afraid to walk at night. When they come to a, a cemetery, however, the centurion abruptly breaks off and walks off toward the tombstones. So the first guy is waiting on the street for his companion to return, and he's getting nervous because it's dark and shadowy, and there's all and all the tombstones are around, and so it's a scary place to be. Then he turns toward this man and sees all of a sudden that the man has stripped naked, and he then urinates on his clothes, and then all of a sudden turns into the into a wolf. It, by the way, is in fact the full moon of that, that particular night. And then he howls and runs off into the woods. This guy is totally terrified. He runs over to the guy's clothes and discovers that they've all been turned to stone. The urinating effect wasn't just random and it wasn't even meant to be comic. That is a specific charm used on the clothes of a werewolf so that no one can get hold of the clothes themselves and thereby be able to possess the werewolf. So the guy runs off. Uh, the first man is terrified, not surprisingly. He rushes back to his girlfriend's house, and he's cutting all the shadows uh, in front of him all, uh, uh, on the way. When he actually arrives um, at the house of his girlfriend, she actually criticizes him the moment he walks in the door by saying, if you had just gotten here a little bit earlier, you could have put a stop to, to what just happened. A wolf just broke into the, the uh, barn and uh, uh, ate up all the sheep. And so the guy runs back, uh, flees at this point and runs back to his own home, and when he gets there, he discovers his companion, the one who had been um, uh, staying in his house, uh, actually uh, outstretched on a couch. And um, Melissa said uh, to uh, his, her boyfriend that when this wolf got into the barn, she managed to throw a spear at it and it went through his neck. When he gets back, he discovers indeed that his, his, his uh, um, house companion, the, the centurion, has been transfixed through the neck. And it's at that point that he realizes that, the, that his companion all along has been a werewolf and he never knew it. So that's a really frightening story. Then um, Tremalchio himself, sort of as in a, a bit of one-upmanship, tells his own story about a funeral, somebody that he knew. Um, it was a mother who was worshiping uh, the, the death of her son, mourning, mourning her son. Um, in the middle of the funeral, all of a sudden, some witches on the outside start cackling. And... Um, one particular man um, uh, goes out to, to, to confront the witches, and as Chimalchio describes it, uh, he gets touched by an evil hand. And when he comes back in, he is, he is so terrified by the experience that he eventually uh, falls ill and dies. Um, in the middle of, 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 the, of this uh, confrontation with the witches, uh, the woman goes back to her son and discovers that the body of her son has been replaced by a straw dummy. And so Tremacchio uses this story as a warning against the witches who wander at night and, as he puts it, turns all things upside down, willy-nilly, uh, whatever is down, they make them up, and vice versa. So, witchcraft, therefore, did exist in both the Greeks and the Roman worlds, as did magic as a whole. And although I don't know necessarily think the average Greek or Roman would have particularly taken it seriously, uh, of actually believing in it, um, there was a general sense in both societies that uh, magic and witchcraft were something to be careful about uh, that uh, theoretically one did have to watch one's behavior because although one didn't really think that it was going to happen, one never knew. And so thank you for, for uh, uh, sitting in on, on this video and uh, we'll see you next video uh, as we start wrapping up uh, our uh, CLA uh, 396 course.